Root canals are not 100% successful. Let's face it, nothing in dentistry is 100% predictable. And sometimes we're confronted with a scenario such as a beautiful central incisor crown and it's a root filled tooth. Or worse yet, a tooth and incisor usually with a long, thick post inside of it. Now, just because it looks good on the radiograph doesn't mean it was a good quality x-ray. We all know that. But anyway, let's say it looks like a decent root filling. There are no voids in it. And now you're really questioning whether it's really feasible to go down a root canal retreatment or is there another option and sometimes that other option which really comes into play in these scenarios is an apisectomy where a flap is raised the infection is curetted and a bit of the root a bit of the apex is chopped away and then bony healing takes place now this is known as microsurgical endodontics it used to be done a lot by oral surgeons in the uk at least many years ago and now endodontists have reclaimed this territory and suggest that actually this is the way we do it to get high predictability and that's exactly what we're going to discuss in this episode hello patricia Rati, i'm jazz galati and i'm joined in this episode by dr peter raftree specialist endodontist and his colleague mandeep desi we'll be talking about all the things you'd want to know about a apisectomy. Does it have a place in general dentistry? How does it compare to an implant in terms of cost-benefit analysis? What are the indications and contraindications of this, as well as talking you through the entire procedure from start to end, including the little details such as what is the retrograde filling material of choice? The protrusive dental pearl for this episode, which really complements this theme of apisectomy really well, is the guidelines, the periridicular surgery guidelines issued by BES and the Royal College of Surgeons. This is such a beautiful document, which covers so many themes of this episode, actually. It's a great revision for this episode itself, and it talks about the indications, contraindications, and really just summarizes really nicely all the guidelines for carrying out periridicular surgery. Now you can download this document on the Protrusive website, that's protrusive.co.uk forward slash 148 because this is episode PDP 148, so forward slash 148. Or if you're on the app, it's on the Protrusive Vault section of all the different files and infographics and all the different things that you get as a Protrusive Premium member. I've also recently added to the Premium Clinical Video section of the app a complete guide on how I did the walking bleach technique on a patient. So discolored and non-vital lateral incisor, how I bleached it internally using the walking bleach technique which we discussed in the previous episodes if you haven't listened already do check out those episodes out with dr aj ray chowdhury and then i also show you how i did the bonding including removal of the old composite and mocking up and actually lengthening the teeth while respecting the occlusion and making sure that restorations are going to be unchippable. So that's all in the premium clinical video section. If you're not already a protrusive premium member, it might be right up your street if you're a dental geek like me, all for the cost of a tax deductible Nando's per month. The website checkout is protrusive.app or you can download it on the iOS or Android store to check out all the protrusive goodness. Now let's join the main interview with Peter and Mandeep and I'll catch you in the outro. Dr. Peter Rakri and Manpreet Desi, uh, welcome to the, the podcast. Uh, Peter, we had you a while ago on surgical extrusion technique, which is a really interesting way to save hopeless teeth. Uh, and today we'll be talking about apisectomies. There's so many questions that uh, come to mind about apisectomies, and I know you two are going to be really great in helping us. But before we uh, go into that, just remind us again, uh, Peter, about yourself, your practice, and you, Manpreet, it's the first time on the show. So tell us about yourselves, guys. Yeah, we're, we're in, uh, we're, we're Hampshire Endodontics at the minute. Uh, we're, we're coming from, speaking from Haven in Hampshire, got a branch in Winchester also, but an endodontics only practice. My, my, my background was the sort of formal training route at the Eastman uh, a long time ago now. But then as things got busier here, you know, put the feelers out and delighted for about a couple of years now to have had Manpreet. It's been a great addition. Yep. So I've been with uh, an associate with Peter for the past two years. I didn't do full-on specialist training. I did a, a part-time MSc at Queen Mary, which I completed probably maybe six or seven years ago. And now spend three days a week doing purely endo and then two days a week still doing a bit of general practice as well. So a bit of a mix. So Manpreet, you did your master's and now you uh, split your time between practice limited to endodontics uh, and also general dentistry. Is your plan potentially in the future to do more and more into endodontics uh, or do you like the, the balance and the split kind of like a, a GDP with enhanced skills? Yeah, I mean, I do like still keeping a hand in with the uh, general dentistry, kind of just so I don't forget doing all of it, but it does have a knock-on effect on my endo as well. So it does help me in terms of 
being able to restore teeth nicely, sort of tying things in with GDPs who refer. So yeah, maybe eventually I'll, I'll start focusing purely, purely on endo, but for the time being, it's nice to do a little bit of a mix. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for the introductions. Now, uh, let's get to the meat uh, of the episode. So apesectomies, right? Just for our young colleagues, just so we're on the same page. When I say uh, apesectomy, some uh, endodontists say we don't call it that anymore. We call it microsurgical endodontics and, and that kind of stuff. So I, I've heard that one before. And also the spelling of apesectomy, uh, I've been told before by a consultant for spelling it, the way it kind of sounds like it should be spelled, but apparently is, is different. That always confused me. But but that's just semantics. Tell, tell me, what do you guys mean when you say apesectomy? So an apesectomy for me is a, uh, a procedure where we purely come from the apical part of the, an apical approach, leave the coronal portion completely alone. And then we're essentially cleaning the lesion out directly from the bone and uh, resecting a portion of the root as well. And I guess, yeah, there are lots of different terms for it. We call it surgery when we're talking to patients here. We just purely call it apical surgery. But yeah, you're right. Some people call it microsurgery when you look at courses and a lot of them they focus and they call it endodontic microsurgery so there are a few different names but yeah we generally tend to call it either apical surgery or apisectomy and do you think this is more the domain of the oral surgeon or the endodontist? Because when I was at dental school, the oral surgeons would actually be doing it in the hospital department because we didn't have any endodontists, right? They'd be doing some apesectomies. And historically, I know that it was a lot of oral surgeons who would just dabble and do these uh, root end resections. And, I, you know, there's a, there's, there's a huge difference. I'm sure you can elaborate in terms of what an oral surgeon does and what an endodontist does. So um, is it a collaborative thing or do you think endodontics have now staked their claim in this type of surgery? Yeah, I think they have uh, won that argument convincingly, comprehensively. I think it, it, it will boil down to funding and, and historical funding structures where everyone knows on the NHS you can get stuff done surgically for free because the NHS chose to fund orthodontics and oral surgery, wisdom teeth out, you know, biopsy of uh, lesions, things like that. And yeah, apisectomy was rolled into that. But interestingly, the, the reason I say it's the argument I feel is now comprehensively won is that in all of endodontics, the success rate in uh, non-surgical treatment, famously, has not really moved much in the last few decades. There are lots of theories about that, but it's frustrating that it hasn't really come on leaps and bounds. The only area of endodontics where the success rate has gone from being a little bit uh, hit and miss to wildly predictable and high is surgical endodontics done via more modern approaches. We just call it modern because no one really wants to hear that they had, you know, a, a hit and hope of a procedure done on, in the past, for example. We just call it a modern revision uh, if we are taking out an amalgam that's nowhere near the apex and uh, filling the canal for the first time with anything. So yeah, it's the area where endodontics has really come on leaps and bounds is uh, apisectomy, which is why we're so eager for everyone to know that. To and, and to, I'd love to think a few people, followers, listeners, will, 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 will be motivated to take the next step towards getting involved. And I guess this is where the microsurgery part of it comes into it as well, because that's essentially what has made those success rates go up with apisectomies, being able to do the procedure with much more precision. I and mean, I'm sure we'll come on to that in a so little bit. Do, do you think one needs to have a microscope to do a good quality apisectomy? No. No, definitely not. But, but magnification and illumination of some sort? Magnification for sure. I mean, I personally actually prefer using my loops when I do an apisectomy. I've got a couple of pairs of loops. In general here, use a microscope for everything, for all our non-surgical treatment but actually if I'm doing an anterior apisectomy I sometimes prefer using my loops just for the fact that you've got more flexibility with the field of vision you know you can move your head around and visualize things a little, for me a little bit better so I actually tend to use my loops and I don't think a microscope is completely necessary to be able to do apisectomies. How much mag are we talking uh, Manpreet? Uh, my loops are five and a half Okay. Yeah. 
good, good guess. That's, that's, that's pretty decent. But uh, uh, I mean, obviously, most apectomies, and correct me if I'm wrong, are uh, anterior. Uh, and so you've got a nice, uh, nicer field of view. And we'll talk about how you manage the soft tissues. Like, for example, I'm a big fan of using Optrigate for my bonding and stuff. Is that the kind of stuff that you'd be using or using like, uh, I don't know, split dam? I mean, that's going to get in the way, obviously. So what kind of uh, things are you using to get the soft tissues out of the way? But before you touch on that, can you just clarify for me, are apectectomies of posterior teeth still a thing? Do you think there's a, a place for that? Yeah, um, yeah, we'd, that, that'd be more your probably specialist and microscope, strictly, you know, the, I believe, with a microscope thing, uh, with a microscope, uh, you know, treatment or uh, modality. Uh, the microscope does allow you to document things nicely with a camera attached, of course. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, you'll see mold. Yeah, anything that's, you know, we're an endo only practice, okay? So we are. We are going the extra mile and a half to not be a, having to say, I can't help. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, what's the word? Um, the mother of all invention, you know, necessity. So, yeah, we're, if there's a molar well buried in bone, part of a bridge, and there's one clearly one root that's the problem, then yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And, and then for anterior teeth, if that's what mostly is being done, uh, what are you using just to, before we can talk about flaps and stuff, what are you using just to keep the soft tissues out of the way? So we're normally just using a normal uh, retractor, surgical retractor, just to keep the uh, soft tissues retracted the whole time. We're not using any rubber dam or octrugate isolation during a surgical procedure. So yeah, it's pretty much just your normal surgical kit, which a lot of dental practices are going to have yeah. because they might have someone who does wisdom tooth extractions, things like this. So um, just normal surgical retractors. Okay, so while we're talking about uh, retraction stuff, let's talk us through like in a um, in a minute or so, just the general procedure, right? You know, so you've got your, we'll come on to diagnosis, indications, contraindications, but just to give it for people a flavor of, of what's involved, you know, for someone who hasn't seen this before, uh, start from raising a flap and, and what is it that you're actually uh, doing that formulates this uh, apectectomy and how you actually finish the procedure as well? Yeah, we'll, uh, following local anesthetic, we'll, we'll get them to mouthwash for about, about half a minute, a minute, so that the sort of field is uh, re as reasonably uh, aseptic as can be, and then yeah, you, the the with the what you you we'll, we'll, when we talk about flaps, we'll talk about flaps. But you'll want your blade to be hitting bone, so that you have a shot at getting the periosteum and the flap up together. Uh, if you start to shred the periosteum, you'll know about it. Lots of bleeding, yeah, lots of bleeding. So you try and get that incision, you know, onto bone. A very firm incision into the bone. Can't stress that. Yeah. Then uh, with a nice new periosteal elevator, because I think the ones I've seen are usually ancient. They were bought ten years ago, and 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 again that that lack of a sharp edge I think will fray and shred the flap as you try and get the there's clearly the bit of gum that you're looking to mobilise versus everything that's staying put. So you'll try and get a uh, I use a boozer. And I'll try and yeah get the uh, try and get a really nice clean sharp flap raised, and more often than not, the cases that you're tackling, as soon as you get the gum out of the way, there'll be a big circular hole in the jawbone, corresponding exactly to what you saw in your pre-op X-ray, and within a few seconds, you're staring at a root tip sat in the middle of that circle. That's I would say how most anterior apicectomies go. Hey guys, it's Jazz. I'm just interfering again with another piece of feedback for the Occlusion Basics and Beyond course, OBAB, occlusion.online. So we've had our first delegate complete module two. Module two is a beast. There are 48 lessons. So on lesson 48, where we do the, like the wrap up, I encourage all the delegates to write a summary of what did you learn during this module? And we do that for all five modules. But this is what Dr. Andrew Hong had to say. He said, my biggest takeaway was looking and identifying wear facets. I picked up the obvious ones that missed the others. Something for me to work on. The articulating paper marks is now making sense to me. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. The other concept I took away was a positive and negative errors with articulators. So we were like, thank you so much. It's, you know, it's great that you're making so much progress. Uh, and then Andrew replied saying, thanks, my mood will do. Uh, I will reiterate that this is great material. Well done to both yourself and Jazz for putting this together. So uh, Dr. Andrew Hong, a massive shout out to you for being one of the first delegates to finish module two. You've still got three, four and five to look forward to. And we look forward to reading more of your reflections as you progress through the course. So regardless of whatever stage you are in your career, if occlusion confuses you, you need OBAB in your life. So check out occlusion.online to enroll, get one year of access to rinse it as much as you can. You get mentorship on the forum. 
and a starter kit delivered to you. This is occlusion made tangible. Now back to the main interview. And and so at, at, at that point, you know, so I've never actually seen what I've seen. Maybe videos of, of one being done. At that point, yes, the the root end resection will start. And there's, you know, I remember being at some lectures many years ago talking about that the angle in which you do it to the not exposed tubules and stuff. So maybe you can talk about that. But what, what, once you get to that stage, are you actually using hyperchlora? I know it sounds like a silly question. I'm, I'm 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 guessing not. But what kind of disinfection protocol are you using at that point? So I guess your main thing here is once you've reflected your flat back, once you've visualized your lesion, your main thing that you're trying to do is to remove all that infected tissue. And so you'll be using your curettes and you'll be detaching all that infected granulation tissue from the bone, from the healthy bone. And that's what you're really focusing on in that first part of the procedure. Sometimes you'll find that that tissue really detaches nicely. Sometimes you might have to work at it a little bit more. And there's a bit of a, a technique to, to detaching it. And then once you've done that, once you've cleaned that lesion out, you've got this nice crypt, you've got this nice big open cavity in the bone, which is hopefully nice and solid. Then you're looking at resecting your root. And you're exactly right. You want to try and come in as horizontal as possible when you're resecting your root. And you're aiming really to remove probably about three millimetres in a normal case from the tip of your root. And why is that? And that there's a good reason for that. And that's because most of your, when you think of a tooth, when you think of your root canal system, at the tip of your root in that final two or three millimetres, you have a lot of complexities, a lot of lateral branches, etc. And so mm -hmm. when you're removing that three millimetre tip, you're removing all those irregularities. You want to come in as horizontal as possible and that's because when you have a beveled root resection you're exposing a lot more tubules and you're creating a lot more of a surface area where you can get bacteria leaking in again so horizontal resection and then really you want to try and use specific ultrasonic tips as well i don't know if there's different brands which make the ultrasonic tips. yeah i think you know um so the majority of your Bacterial killing is probably the, well, uh, removing three millimeters of habitat, you know, literally uh, cutting out the root tip. And so the bacteria that, that are in those nooks and crannies and the habitat that they could otherwise occupy. But then you'll, then you will uh, probably go for a three millimeter retro prep with an ultrasonic tip. And that is the equivalent of, I like, suppose, mechanical debridement. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're mechanically, you get a bit of heat with an ultrasonic tip. Uh, but yeah, you are mechanically debriding the inside of the canal. That's another nod towards our trying to kill bacteria. When a case is going incredibly well and bleed, you know, blood, ble bleeding has stopped nicely, then yeah, you absolutely can introduce sodium hypochlorite if if you have. I'd say it, it wouldn't be on your first case or your or, or even your fifth case. But yeah, when things are going really nicely, I will introduce a little bit of sodium hypochlorite. We're talking okay. a lot less than one milliliter and it, and it sat ever so uh, nicely in there. But don't forget a bit of so, you know, a bit of dilute sodium hypochlorite does not do any harm. Uh, in extruded sodium hypochlorite under pressure does harm, but simply bathing and, you know, but if, if by accident a droplet were to spill out over the uh, retro prep into the crypt, it will do less than zero uh, harm. Okay, so it's quite different to a, a hyperchloride accident. That's a different beast. Uh, we've covered that before in, in a medical legal episode we covered. So it's, it's good to know, actually, just to make it tangible. A few points that come to mind, you know, uh, so you've, when you've done your root end resection or raise a flap and you've curated out all the, all the junk, what's stopping the bone just constantly bleeding and, and filling up the crypt with blood? How do you get that moisture control from, from the bleeding? It quite often does. And one way that we try to normally control that bleeding is just with packing gauze, sterile gauze, into that uh, into the crypt. Uh, you can soak that gauze in some hemostatic and pack that into the crypt. You may have to keep on replacing that throughout, but that normally does enough to stop the bleeding so that you can actually visualise your route and you can carry out your prep and place your retrofill. Sometimes you're lucky and uh, you're doing the procedure, you're cleaning everything out, and everything's just nicely under control. There's not much bleeding at all. I guess another thing which makes a difference is actually your local at mm -hmm. the beginning. 
putting plenty of local in there, actually injecting it through when you're giving that buccal infiltration, actually trying to guide your needle into the lesion. So you're injecting it in there and getting some vasoconstrictor into that lesion. Yeah, that, that, that's something that's very different from what anyone will have done before. So you're, you're lining up an apisectomy case and you are deliberately trying to get the tip of the local anesthetic needle into the lesion. Uh, we're always told, aren't we, to just barely touch bone and then retract so as not to disturb the peri. But in these instances, if you don't introduce local anesthetic into the mushy soft tissue occupying the space where bone should be, then curetting that stuff is going to be very, very painful. And I would just mm -hmm. say, I'm certain that the stuff that's causing the bleeding, preventing your visualization, is the soft tissue occupying the space where bone should be. So I probably would just spend the first few minutes curetting, curetting, curetting. And once you've done that thoroughly, that's the stuff that pumps blood in my, uh, typically. Got it. And then just another real world question, like, you know, if, if GDPs were to tackle their first case, question that might, uh, Protrude Sarati might be thinking right now is, do I need a special handpiece? Is there a risk of surgical emphysema if they use their standard fast handpiece with their air mist and the water? Uh, or do you have to use saline? These are the real world questions that might be going through someone's head. Uh, any advice on that, guys? Yeah, you don't want to be using your, your normal fast handpiece, your normal, your normal uh, air turbine. You want to be using something specifically for surgical procedures. So you've got a few options. That could be a, uh, a rear venting turbine. Uh, that could be a, an electric handpiece. But yeah, you don't want something which is going to be blowing air into that surgical area. You want to have a specific handpiece which is, which is made for doing surgery. Okay, I, I thought so, but it's just a, a help to, helpful to clarify for that. So uh, I think that's enough on the procedure because I'd really like to get into indications and contraindications because this is a big one. When dentists are uh, faced with that diagnostic dilemma and they're thinking of referring or doing the, doing the case themselves, what would you say is a... Let's start with contraindications. It might be easier, right? Like a crappy root canal, primary root canal treatment. How far do you go with that? What are the contraindications? And therefore, how, how, do, we, how do we spin that on his head and say, what is the ideal scenario for a apisectomy because remember peter we talked about the the hopeless teeth and the surgical extrusion you gave some very good guidelines okay yeah well this is a a good scenario this is a bad scenario what kind of guidelines can you give to us for for choosing the right tooth well if i could i'll start off with uh some of the more dry formal bit and then i'll let maybe manpre give you his sort of personal flavor uh on the job as it were but the british endo website british endo society website has free pdfs very, uh, you know, recently updated guidelines for surgical endodontics, which has contraindications also. Again, almost like an exam answer would be medical, you know, people who you don't want to be doing surgical procedures on, you know, Mirange, Ronge and Mirange and uh, the other ones, you know, the uh, radiation, uh, bony, non-healing type people, uh, IV uh, bisphosphonates, uh, on, you know, or oral bisphosphonates with steroids for an extended period. You know, people who are, I guess, incredibly unwell, you know, the ASA classification, people who I don't tend to find that the INR or blood thinners are an issue, if I'm honest. But yeah, I'll let maybe Manpre, whilst there's a good list of them, uh, an exam style answer on, on this PDF that's freely available, maybe Manpre, who has more recently embraced it, uh, so he's younger than me. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, he might be able to give you some of his uh, real world, you know, uh, more more day to day answers. Yeah, I guess when you're assessing a case for for an apisectomy, there's a, there's a couple of things which I think of, and your usual your standard situation is that you're you're going to have a tooth in front of you which has already had a root canal treatment. The root canal treatment's failed, and now you're thinking of what you're going to do next. So for me. I sort of look at this and I think, is this is there a coronal issue here? Is there something that is leaking and causing bacteria to leak in coronally? Or is this a purely apical issue? Because that's going to guide you on what approach you're taking. If there's something going on coronally, you're going non-surgically. You're doing a, a re-RCT. And what I mean by coronal, I mean, is there a, a very poor filling on the tooth? which is leaking? Is there a very poor crown, which has bad margins around it? Is there a post crown, which has come off recently and, and bacteria has leaked in? 
all these things, you're not looking at doing that, doing an apicectomy. You're looking at going in non-surgically and revising everything. If everything coronally is perfect, you know, we often ask the patient if they've got a crown on the tooth or they've got a post on the tooth, has this ever come off? Has this come off recently in the last couple of years? If everything is fine from a coronal aspect, then apicectomy starts to become a realistic option. And so in those sort of situations, I think what I would look at is the quality of the root filling, the existing root filling. And I always ask myself, is this a root filling which is instantly improvable? Is there areas of that root filling which can be made better? Is it halfway down the root? Is it a really crappy root canal to begin with? Because if it is, then again, I'm going non-surgically. If that root canal is generally looking good, if that is a root canal treatment which has been already retreated in those sorts of situations, then I'm leaning more towards surgery and apicectomy. It has to be really, for me, a root filling which is serving its purpose and I'm not going to gain much by redoing that root canal. That's brilliant. The only issue which I'm, you know, you, you guys probably say this all the time and you guys are more aware of this than, than any of the GDPs. But when we see a radiograph and when we see a root filling that looks apparently decent, we don't know if hypochlorite was used. We don't know if rubber dam was used. How do you make that judgment, you know, to, to yeah, okay, just because it looks good, is it actually good? There is a bit of a leap of faith in terms of how well the root canal treatment was done, right? There definitely is. And again, this is where during your examination, you're asking questions like, who did the root canal? Was this done by a specialist or someone with special interest? Do you remember your dentist placing- you Hold up a rubber dam. A rubber dam, yeah. yeah you take Do you recognize this? Out. Do you recognize this? And if, if they're not instantly like, oh, that thing, you're like, okay, possibly wasn't used, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's getting little clues, right? Because uh, it's, it's difficult. Possibly in the real world, the biggest tip of the balance is, is there expensive, good looking, recent prosthodontics on top of this tooth? And if there is, you know, it might be that the dentist has perfectly reasonably chosen not to revise an endo on a tooth that they're incorporating into a bridge because the endo looks all right and has been there for, it looks, it looks, it looks sort of eight out of 10. It hasn't been a bother. I don't think mm -hmm. it's going to be very easy to sell on top of the expensive bridge to that person and a specialist root canal redo just in case it becomes a problem. So I do think, uh, and I think it's reasonable that the dentist might well then put some new expensive, good looking prosthodontics onto the tip and then Murphy's Law, St. Patrick's Day the other day, things might flare up and then we're, we're, we're looking to preserve that expensive prosthodontic work. I mean, how far do you go? I mean, you're talking mostly about, let's talk about anterior teeth. A lot of times you can root treat through a crown. You guys are way more experienced than I am at that. But it's it's probably the post that obviously you think, okay, yeah, we've, we've got to look at the uh, other side here. But in terms of drilling through zirconia anterior crowns, for example, to do a retreatment, does that worry or bother you as a limited endodontics? No, no. Something we do commonly. I think zirconia is actually not as difficult to drill through as a lot of people think it is. I was told a little tip a while ago by someone somewhere, it might have been, been on your podcast, to use a, a red band polishing burr when you're going through zirconia and it works wonders. You're through the zirconia in, in, in no time at all. So going through a crown and redoing an endo is something that we do very commonly, but I'd start to say that that's when you do start to need good magnification. You do start to need a microscope when you're doing something like that because it's very, very easy to, to not be able to see what you're doing underneath. Yeah, yeah. There's always more risk and roll when you're going through crowns and stuff. I totally concur. And yeah, using a, a yellow band or red band uh, does help cutting through zirconia for sure. In terms of cost benefit analysis, though, right? You don't. I mean, it'd be, it'd be nice to know. Like, you know, we, there was there's forums on on Facebook and dentists talk all the time. Like, okay, how much are people charging for implants nowadays? And the general consensus is, you know, two point five to four k. 
how much, if you don't mind me saying, is roughly the range of a, a, you know, an apicectomy. Because one of the considerations one may have, because if you're doing surgery anyway and the patient's suitable for surgery, then instead of doing the apicectomy to extract the offending tooth, uh, graft it, and then go for an implant in the future, that's a, something that's got a, a discussion that you, I'm sure you have as part of your consent. So if you do a cost-benefit analysis, what's that looking like for versus an implant? We have, we have a very narrow range, it's single figure. We charge a, a fee per procedure, per tooth, whether it's non-surgical treatment, non-surgical retreatment, apicectomy, just whatever it is. We've just got this one figure, comfortably less than a thousand pounds. So yeah, we're, I suppose we're trying to in- incentivize people to give it a go. We're a, the modern mantra is, you know, save teeth, etc. And yeah, if they're happy with that bridge or, or, or uh, casting, if they don't, if they're not saying, yeah, it falls out all the time. And even if it, you're know, all, I'm itching to replace it. You know, as soon as I spend some money on this tooth, some of the money I spend on will be getting that gray margin removed. But if they are entirely happy with the casting, usually is, then yeah, I would just leave it alone and just sort of go up, go up above uh, apicectomy wise. Yeah. So I think we're, we are costing them for, for the cost for exploring whether an apicectomy is going to work is about a quarter of the price uh, of an implant and it's kind of over with in two hours there isn't a scan a graft wearing a flipper plate for a mm-hmm. few weeks no uh, no lab bill multiple surgical pre- yeah 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 no yeah no lab bill yeah so i don't know it's that kind of uh, if this works i am streets ahead financially i think patients are thinking but yeah, yeah, we, we're not successful uh, 100% of the time. So for those people, I'm sure they see it as a unfortunate waste of money. So, so let's talk about that. What are the accepted success rates in the literature? Uh, and do we have any data? It'd be really interesting to know if there's any data on, because I know there is data, I couldn't quote you the authors right now, but uh, for GDP primary endo versus specialist primary endo, that kind of data I've seen, uh, I've seen around. Uh, is there anything on, on the apicectomy side? Just in general, what are the success rates we're looking at? Uh, obviously, every case is different, but also do we know about uh, GDPs versus uh, specialists in that domain? Well, yeah, a, um, another useful free d- uh, PDF download from the, is from the Royal College of Surgeons that we'll make sure you have. But in, 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 their, in their document, they quote uh, success, apicectomy success rates in the sort of 90s, you know, low to low to, yeah, low 90s. So that is where it has really come on leaps and bounds with just modern, yeah, modern everything, modern materials, modern equipment, you know, materials, literally, yeah, modern materials, modern, modern instruments and uh, modern, yeah, concepts. So yeah, 90s, you say, yeah, apicectomy is, uh, I would say, very predictable. In a lot of the literature now, the success rates for, for apicectomies aren't particularly different to the success rates of, of normal endo they're up there in the same sort of ballpark. And from experience in practice as well, I'd say that probably 90% of the cases we do heal up. Yeah. And and uh, in terms of GDP, do we have any GDP data? I mean, I don't know how many GDPs are doing this kind of work to be honest with you, but you know, an experienced GDP who has some surgical skills and raises flaps, uh, this is a nice little thing to add on in terms of uh, keeping your interest, you know, and trying to go the extra mile, save teeth. Do we have any data on how GDPs are, are faring when it comes to apicectomies? No, I don't believe that. I don't believe that exists. But recollect, you know, distant recollections from training and, and when I was literature, you know, savvy, uh, there, there just was an appreciable difference between the or- apicectomies coming out of the oral surgery department and apicectomies coming out of the endo department for fairly obvious reasons. Uh, the oral surgery department are using amalgam. They're not using. I don't know. I don't. Yeah, they, they, they are slash were using amalgam. They were generally. I suppose, being remunerated at a lower level, which possibly, probably influences the time they might attribute to that procedure. And I suppose we have that intimate knowledge from the, all the author grade treatments, uh, intimate knowledge of uh, the kinks and the nooks and the crannies that we're maybe dealing with. Mm-hmm. So there's an appreciable, significant daylight of distance between the success rate from modern techniques, materials, equipment, compared to traditional but i don't think there's the exact answer to your exact question unfortunately however we are all for and all about 
and just getting involved. Absolutely. Well, that, that, that's good because, like I said, it adds another uh, string to people's bow, right? It's a, it's a good thing to have. I'm just going to load up a photo, guys, because the next question is about do you always need, like, I think we've kind of touched on it. If you've got, like, a really good uh, ortho-grade restoration, sorry, uh, like a coronal restoration, well-sealed, looks pretty, uh, and you've got a good root filling, yes, this is in play. You're considering an apisectomy. But I'll show you a recent case. This is my grandfather uh, in law. Let me just see if I can show you. So those who are listening will describe it. So he's got a reservoir and bridge, which you may remember from a video I posted on YouTube. It, it uh, debonded. I didn't do it in the first place, but it debonded. But I had the privilege of going through a full protocol and showing you how I rebond these bridges. So that's what we're looking at here. And next to it is a singular crown on an 82-year-old gentleman. It's got a root filling. And uh, instead of me saying about the quality of the root filling based on how it looks, I'll get you guys to judge that because this is what you do day in, day out. And it's got a lovely round, I don't know, I'll size that as maybe 10 millimeters. You guys are, again, a better judge than I am. Ridiculous pathology, nice circular one. So what do we think about this coronal restoration? What do we think about this uh, root filling and the, the diagnosis of the pathology that we see? Is that cystic? Is it granuloma? What are your thoughts, chaps? So I guess when, when I look at that, in answer to your original question, you wouldn't necessarily have to redo that endo underneath there. Again, sort of as I was mentioning before, if I'm happy with the seal on that crown, I definitely wouldn't be redoing that endo just as a precursor to going in and doing surgery. But I guess my concern here with this tooth would be the fact that that lesion extends so far up that root. And how much root are you going to have left here when you clean out that lesion and resect it? Is there going to be enough for that tooth to be, to be strong enough? Is that, that's a very heavily prepared tooth, is that root cracked? Because there's a, it looks like to me there's a little bit of a communication crestally on that mesial side of that root. So there's a few things that would worry me about going in and trying to save this tooth with a surgical procedure. Uh, Peter, anything from you there? Well, yeah, um, but if we were to, ins if we, you know, I just, I'm, repeat the point really it's just that if we were to insist on taking the crown off revising the endo prior to any surgery it just becomes from a faff and a cost point of view and an inconvenience point of view unattractive unpalatable so what 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 your grandfather-in-law might go for is if someone could say well look i'll i'll i could execute a really modern apisectomy and do you know what? If it's ended on to kinetiology, it probably will resolve. And if it doesn't, it won't, which is a little bit maybe imprecise in terms of um, the 21st century offering to a patient. However, in the real world, it's the language a lot of patients, I think, can uh, digest pretty much instantly. Well, oh, yeah. So if that tooth compromised in support, though, it might if it's not wobbly pre-op, I'm thinking I can only make it better. So yeah, if mm -hmm. it's not wobbly, grade two or above, if it's grade one or less, and it, yeah, I think that when I get in there and do my bit, I'm going to be making it firmer, not less firm. So yeah, and from our previous podcast about extruding teeth, I've got a great faith that teeth can function reasonably on less root buried in bone than we would otherwise think. So obviously we're talking about the crown root ratio, which is always important to consider. And I know this is limited information. This is not how we do our dentistry. We want a full diagnosis, full picture, uh, the occlusion, the pocketing. But with this limited information, we'll get a vote from each of you. Uh, with the limited information provided based purely on radiograph, which is not how we do dentistry, but just for the uh, amuse me, uh, are we going for a re-RCT, i.e. so that would involve either going through the crown or dismantling the crown, uh, doing the re-RCT uh, and then uh, restoring the crown or doing a new crown potentially, depending on what we find inside, versus go straight in for the apisectomy for this 82-year-old, fairly uh, healthy gentleman otherwise? Personally, if he was keen on treating and saving that tooth, I wouldn't be re redoing that root canal. I don't see much benefit to be gained from that. I would be going in and just dealing with it surgically. The benefit of just purely going in one procedure, in and out, see how it heals, see how it responds. Well, a lesion of that size and of that vividness, I don't find will often heal non-surgically. It is true that big lesions heal 
And you do see those people with their five year follow ups, etc. However, there's something really attractive within a single procedure, doing a nice modern thorough apisectomy, scooping out all the mush, uh, letting fresh blood bleed in there, which in the absence of any infection will become rock hard bone nice and quickly. So yeah, I, I, yeah, no, I would uh, absolutely be offering surgery. Th that's what actually I was thinking as well, because of the, how well defined that radiolucity was, and, and, and therefore it may well need some surgical intervention anyway, right? And to extend some time for, for this tooth, rather than having to go through a, a cumbersome process of drilling through the crown. And yeah, we know that lower incisors that got crowns, especially way back when, when he had it, is not an ideal uh, restorative scenario. Uh, can you guess, any guesses as what's what the NHS hospital said? Yeah. I wonder, the oral surgery department, we, you know, we can't help. Yes. So they said, uh, you need to, we need to tick this box that you've had a re-RCT. Can we tick this box or not? No, we can't. Therefore, uh, no able surgery. So it's like a tick box thing for them. Like, okay, no re-RCT, no uh, able surgery. So they sent him back saying, okay, find someone to do a re-RCT. So I'll be sending him to uh, Ama Al-Hurani for a consultation now to see if he fancies this. And, and let's see what he says. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to seeing how it goes. Yeah, now, now we're invested. I guess the only thing I would say about that case is... A CBCT scan might show that there's an extra root canal inside. Mm -hmm. There may be a, a link branch or something, in which case maybe you'd consider going in and redoing it. But yeah, that's the only thing I can, that's the only possible reason why I would be taking off the crown and re redoing the root canal on that. Yeah, good point. As someone who's got, uh, who's had all four of his lower incisors root filled and all four had two canals, uh, yes, I can, I can definitely vouch for that. But that's for a story for another time. So uh, do, to answer bluntly, uh, do you always need a re-RCT? I think the, uh, the answer there is no, you don't always because you've got to take every case uh, from its merit and look at what's uh, on top. Are, are you happy with that answer that, yeah, not, no, it's, it's not a guaranteed rule that you have to always have a re-RCT before considering an apisectomy, right? Just at Reading District Hospital by the sounds of it. Isn't that where you are? Up in Berkshire? Pangbourne or something? The hospital was, uh, it was either Guy's or Eastman. It was one of the two. Hey. Yeah, no. So no, outside of the ivory towers, no, it's just, it's not, I, I, I'm incredibly infrequent. Yeah, in the real, in the real world of endo, incredibly infrequent. One or the other, it just becomes un, unrealistic to, 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 yeah, to do both. By the time you factor in a re-root canal, a vasectomy, a crown, you know, you're looking at significantly more, possibly than an implant. So, yeah, not realistic. Yeah, so for pragmatic reasons, sometimes it is appropriate to, to make your apisectomy the next choice and not necessarily go always going for uh, the re-RCT when the conditions are, are, are right. So a final question before I ask about uh, GDPs trying to... To get into the skill is just uh, just a little uh, just tell me retrograde feeling of choice nowadays so uh, we've in the past amalgam then I know IRM was in favour uh, is it now uh, MTA and biodentine or is there something newer that I, I don't know about I think we differ on that what's your go to there's a few options there's a few options so IRM is good because it's easy to handle and that can't be overstated when you're when you're in the middle of a surgical procedure you've got this very 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 tiny retro prep which you're trying to fill you may have a short window of time to get that filling in before your crypt fills up with blood again so IRM is very good in that respect because it's nicely packable MTA is very very good but it is difficult to handle the original MTA the one which you mix as a powder and a cement very, very difficult technically to place into your retrofilling. But nowadays, there's newer materials. There's uh, bioceramic putties, which you can get, which are available from all sorts of places. And they are basically MTA based, but much easier to place. And I think that's what a lot of people are, are starting to shift over to. But I would say we use IRM. A fair bit, don't we? Yeah, your your MSC uh, coordinator Chong, his he's got a good paper showing no difference in the outcome of vasectomies between IRM and MTA. Yeah, I absolutely latched onto that paper, and yeah, I find uh, IRM. I'm so familiar with it. Uh, I know when it's on the turn, and I can really start to pack it. I don't get that with bidentine or MTA or those putties. Yeah. Okay, so something we already have, which is which is good to know. Familiarity, yeah. 
Exactly. And and then so just last question before I ask you about actually getting the right tools and whatnot to, to do this, because, uh, you know, you mentioned a little bit about the surgical kit and stuff, but what are the different things that you might need to get? But uh, just last question, uh, grafting. So once you've done your uh, procedure uh, and you're happy and you put your retrograde filling, do we need to put some cow bone in there or what, what is the, the sort of packing procedure, if you like, of the crypt? None. No substitute for a blood clot. Blood is incredible. Mm-hmm. That's why the Kardashians are putting it all over their face. Blood, blood is incredible. <laughs> Our blood clot. Yeah. Um, yeah, just blood, you know, you break, you, if your kid breaks, his, you know, God forbid, breaks their bone, you just put the two ends of the bone together and the blood clot does the rest. A blood clot. No grafting, no membranes. Generally, I can think of about one case of where I've used membranes, one case I've used grafting, but lots of cases that have succeeded without it. But yeah, you, you be careful not to get too... I, I, I'm feeling I want to be careful of not getting too overcomplicated. But yeah, no, uh, if you eradicate the infection and uh, the blood clot will become bone. Okay, brilliant. So tell us about equipment, because I think so much of the success, even specialized mirrors uh, and the ultrasonics that you said, what kind of kit would a dentist need to invest in to get some predictable outcome? So we're as far away from the oral surgery way of doing it as possible and closer towards microsurgical endodontics. So, yeah, I think there's to be able to do to do an apisectomy using microsurgical techniques. There are a few bits and pieces that we need to have. We've already touched on magnification. I think for the GDP out there, loops loops are definitely sufficient. Uh, we've touched on the hand pieces. I think the ultrasonic tips are, are brilliant. Absolutely, absolutely recommended. I personally tend to use a three millimeter retro prep tip for most cases, and I think that would be sufficient for for most GDPs. And just describe what they are. So they're sort of a uh, your normal ultrasonic tip is that shape, but these retro prep tips are like that. And so you can bring your ultrasonic tip in at the same angle as your handpiece, but that tip can actually hook into the uh, the end of a root. It can clear out about three millimeters of a root canal space, gives you a really, really nice clean area, which you can pack your retrofilling into. So I definitely recommend those ultrasonic tips. I definitely recommend, like you said, some micro mirrors, micro pluggers, Again, microsurgically, if we're going to see what we're doing properly, we need small mirrors to be able to get into that root surface. We need small pluggers to be able to pack into that very, very tight space to condense that filling in there. And then, yeah, what sort of material are we going to pack it with? So we use IRM, but I guess that's up to up to the dentists themselves. Well, I think to get a feel for the, the, the kit and stuff and, and, and to really delve deeper, uh, I wouldn't expect anyone to listen to, to start doing it on the back of this uh, podcast. Obviously, it's a good overview and start to get you to think about it as an option, whether you're referring it or considering doing it. Tell us about the type of courses out there for dentists at the moment. Uh, is it something that you run or something that you recommend for, for dentists to consider? If, if I may just briefly, uh, quick, but I once saw a Hugh Freedy glossy document came out and it, and it had various eminent clinicians talking about their ideas set of instruments for this procedure, free gingival graft, that procedure, second stage implant surgery, but endo was overlooked. So I got in touch with them and this is probably 10 years ago now, uh, Hugh Freedy UK and specifically Chris Mason, but we sort of put together a Rolls Royce of a kit for modern endo surgery. Now with a specific accent on the listeners who are thinking of getting involved, um, just prior to us doing this this evening, I was in touch with Chris Mason at Hugh Freedy, and he sort of ha, ha, he, he he might expect one or two emails, you know, for, from someone, and he'll have costed up a bare bones of a kit that you could do endo with uh, the mirror, the pluggers, the little curettes, things like that. So there's a reasonably convenient one place gets get you know you can one stop shop perhaps for a maybe a small and a large surgical kit. You know, I think the small one's about five instruments and the large one's maybe about 12. On the subject of courses... I mean, I'll, I'll put the link, by the way. I'll put it if someone may want to get the kit. So I'll put the link in the, in the show notes for anyone who's interested in, in the kit that you said would be a good one to, for a GDP to look into. Courses that I'm aware of. They, my, my old buddy, uh, Daniel Flynn, is later this year. He's toothsaver.co.uk. Uh, later this year, he's taken a bunch of uh, delegates out to Colombia 
to do an in-depth endosurgery course. That is so cool. that sounds like real intense. Yeah, uh, up in Manchester, Endo 61 is the practice. Uh, the, the immediate past president of the British Endo Society, I believe, immediate or maybe one prior, Sanj Banderi, uh, he uh, is very uh, active as well in promoting his endosurgery course. S- S- Sanj was um, a, a great guest of the podcast. Uh, I don't know if you got to listen to that one, uh, very real world about irreversible papitis and, and yeah. hot pops and how to manage that. So, yeah, the, it's, it's ending by Sanj is uh, always appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, so elsewhere there's the, the Italian guys who run sort of Delta Dental Academy. I think they, they have a, an offering where it's sort of like a live demonstration, I believe. But there'd be three ports of call for anyone, you know, with a, you know, with a mobile phone can send off field email. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you you putting together some some ideas, different people to learn from uh, on, on this uh, technique that you guys are so passionate about, and you want GDPs to consider. Uh, I definitely think it adds a new string to yeah. to their bow and makes it more fascinating. And uh, even if dentists don't go ahead and, and consider doing uh, apical surgery uh, in that way, they'll get they'll get uh, a few nuggets in terms of diagnosis, in terms of what's actually needed, uh, what to consider, what's a reasonable referral, uh, and when they might actually be better better off um, looking at the coronal restoration and a re-RCT. So it, it paints a good picture for the GDP to consider. Um, any final words, chaps? I really appreciate uh, the time this evening. Uh, any final words on um, apisectomies uh, as an overview for the general dentist? But one one I, one point yeah, I want to say is that the, 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 the listeners, Petruza Arti, should be emailing slash badgering their local endodontist. What we, what we do do here in Hampshire is, on occasion, we'll get a dentist who will send in a case but they'll also often say, P.S., I'm sort of doing an MSc or uh, and will. Uh, it has happened where the person, patient, has come here. The dentist has come here. I've set aside a couple of hours in my time. I should confess, I take the fee, the endo fee, but I'll uh, watch them, supervise them, do the surgery. And in usually then uh, where I can make it work and viable is that the dentist will then take the stitches out four, five, six, seven days later and do the follow-up, etc. But yeah, if someone were to email us, say, look, I've got this case, do you think it's a good one to start with? Then yeah, it, it's not beyond, the, it's not beyond uh, realism that they might be able to do the apisectomy at their local endodontist place. We do that. I mean, that is brilliant. I mean, to, that, that is the highest and best form of learning, right? The, that is way beyond even shadowing. That is actually uh, having over the shoulder someone watching and guiding you. It's a bit like what they do in the implant world, right? So why can't we have it in the endo world? So well, well done, Peter, for, for having that kind of uh, availability and allowing dentists to, to do that. So hats off to you, mate. Yeah. Yeah, so as, as, as someone who comes from more of a general dentist background and hasn't done specialist training and always used to absolutely hate surgery and always shied away from it. I would say to anyone out there that once you've done one or two apisectomies, they are nowhere near as difficult or as scary as you think they are. I would second what Peter says. That's what I did myself. I watched a few procedures a good few years ago got my hand stuck in to the point where I was comfortable to have a go myself. And just from doing one by yourself, you you gain that confidence, you gain that real world experience of, of trying to figure out what you're doing. And then from there, you'll be happy to tackle anything. It's just having a go at it in the first place. Like with anything in, in dentistry, like a, a, any new technique. Almost finished with a riddle, but because uh, I'm conscious of the time, etc. But Getting comfortable with surgery makes your non-surgical treatment and offering better. Mm. Definitely haven't got the time to expand on that, but it's one that might um, rattle around. Yeah, you take on more, you're more... Yeah, if, if you think, oh, I can rescue this surgically, should the need arise, you just bec- you become a better non-surgical endodontist if you, if you are at least au fait surgically. Amazing. Well, uh, guys, I, I really appreciate you guys uh, giving up your time and, and talking about a, 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 to- a topic that's almost uh, overlooked. It's definitely the first time we've covered uh, a pisectomy, so it's well overdue. Uh, and I appreciate it, um, you know what you guys do, especially Peter with the the you know you guys having dentists over and and, and getting them to, to to do it so they can learn. I mean, I just love that so much. So I appreciate your your time. Please send me those links so I can populate the show notes with the PDFs and the links and how dentists can reach out to you to to collaborate and work together and, and just gain advice from because you're very good at helping 
helping dentists out based on that uh, hopeless teeth uh, episode that we did as well. So we appreciate your your time and wisdom. I know you're a busy father as well as um, an endodontist. So uh, guys, thank you so much for giving your time up. Thank you very much. Um, you. Glad to see it. Go from strength to strength. Good luck. Yeah, keep it up. Well, there we have it, guys. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. If you're a Protrusive Premium member, you're just a few questions away from gaining some CPD on the app. So just answer those few questions, get your CPD emailed to you by Marie, who's my CPD lead. And it's also a great way to validate your learning. Now, remember that some of the things that Peter and Mandeep shared, the documents they sent me, they're on the website, forward slash 148. That's protrusive.co.uk forward slash 148. And as well as the RCS guidelines, uh, Peter's also sent me like a recommended equipment list. Like if you're a general dentist who wants to do this kind of treatment what is the kit that you should buy and that's all there provided by peter thanks so much peter for that and mandeep and i'll catch you guys in the next episode thank you again for listening all the way to the end